These last 12 months watching anime, season to season, have left me utterly awestruck. The beauty in the composition that studios have been producing has been immaculate, enhancing their storytelling to euphoric levels. Perversity to the standards seems to be these studios' new mottos in order to produce the most luscious images that are superficially attractive and entertaining, yet composed with ambition. They said, hey, take your low-budget animation and throw it in the trash can because we thought up more clever and visually appealing ways to save our budget. Today we'll be talking about the beauty of animation and the impact it has on your experience. In this video, there will be footage of the following shows, Princess Principal, Berserk, Dragon Ball Super, Violet Evergarden, Boku no Hero Academia, the show with the Crystal Girls I'm not going to try to pronounce, and more. This is your spoiler warning. While I try to select a cornucopia of spoiler-free clips, someone's going to get upset I ruined the innocence of their waifu by showing them with clothes on or something. You get the idea. You are being warned right now. While you watch this video, I want you to keep in mind the anime that immersed you the most, the one that was the most visually appealing, that drew you in where you couldn't stop watching it, and post it in the comments below. Let's talk about how animes are, well, actually animated. Japan hires a lot of young and middle-aged men that enjoy drawing pretty girls at incredibly low wages, while America ruins the industry by stealing all the show's content. Absolutely kidding. About the piracy part, at least. Animes are usually designed with 24 FPS in mind. The acronym FPS stands for frames per second. This means you can have up to 24 unique pictures go across the screen in one second while you're watching the show. Movies are also shot in 24 FPS, which is why they have that film look. 30 FPS feels more like a home video, and 60 FPS gets you that extra smooth, real life, almost uncomfortably awkward feeling. People always think 60 FPS means the best of animation, but it can also look really, really bad, unless it's planned out well. Take this clip of Dragon Ball Super characters talking in 60 FPS. Their mouth movements make me so incredibly uncomfortable, it's almost unwatchable. Now, take a look at the badass scene from Attack on Titan that was planned to be 60 FPS. Smooth as silk. Crisp. Elegant and damn well animated. It really drives that tension into your soul like you're going to be consumed by a 60-foot humanoid naked fetus monster. Now keep in mind, 24 FPS is actually high quality for anime, because every individual action is represented by one unique frame inside of the shot. This would be the pinnacle if every studio was able to do this. Only problem is that would cost some fat stacks, or a lot of serious sales of female characters, Dakamakura, Dakamakura, Dakam, body pillows. Not all studios have this budget, which is why you get the terms ones, twos, threes, and fours. This simply means hold the image in that frame that much longer. This makes it so you have to draw less pictures to make it a 24 FPS animation. Let's discuss the terms I just mentioned. Twos means to hold a frame or a picture for two frames. This means an action, 24 frames per second, is actually 12 unique pictures because you're holding a frame two times longer per image. Threes means you're holding a frame for three times as long as you normally would a normal frame, and you end up with eight pictures. The lowest quality animation you can have is fours, in which you are holding an image four times as long and end up with six unique pictures at the end. Now let's do a quick recap. Ones is the highest quality animation you can possibly have because there's a unique picture for every single frame while you have fours on the under the end of the spectrum, which is the lowest quality animation you can have, but also takes one-fourth the time as ones. Finding a combination is the real sweet spot. Ones is usually used for very impactful scenes or high action scenes that are going to take a lot of motion and a lot of movement. Twos are usually set up for scenery scenes or just characters interacting with each other besides just talking. Threes are really good for low-impact animation, such as turning pages, picking up books, moving glasses of water, opening a bento box, or things that don't have a lot of motion to them. Fours is usually used for dialogue scenes or to pad out scenes. <clears throat> I'm looking at you here, Dragon Ball Super. In the current industry, fours are a necessary evil because they allow you to save budget by padding out scenes, and that way you can save more budget for higher quality action scenes later on down the line. Some shows even reuse old animations over and over and over again from previous episodes. Some even reuse scenes from the same episode. I'm looking at you, Dragon Ball Super. Again. The less movement you have to make, the less you have to animate. And the show can save budget. And the show can still go on. Anime uses all kinds of tricks of the trade to save budget or to move the story. Some shows are just way better at it than others, and these are the shows I want to talk about today. 
The Ancient Mega's Bride is a really good example of a show with breathtaking visuals while also following your typical 1, 2s, 3s, and 4s standard. The thing is, because the art is amazing, and the way the characters interact with each other feels so genuine, it is really hard to pull you out of its visual entrapment. It essentially gives you the wonder of Harry Potter. I'm talking about the entrapment of actual fantasy and setting and not the entrapment of, of Emma Watson on Millennial's pants. It involves you in a world of mystic and wonder, but it keeps you there. It holds you there, because you never stop to go, eh. The animation felt really awkward or off. Everything that show has to offer in its visuals is captivating. I mean, look at the food. Even Arena Nakiri would eat this. The small details that this world creates are always enticing to follow, and each and every one of them helps build this mystical world of anything can happen around the characters. It takes you back to when you were a kid, and someone used to read to you. It's pure imagination in its simplest, most visual form. Some of their scenes are flat out stills. The stills last for so long, but are beautifully captivating, you wouldn't dare turn them off. When you watch something and notice an animation quirk, it can really pull you out of that experience. I mean, some shows can pull you out of the experience by being actual dumpster fires, i.e. King's Game. Take Iromanga Sensei, for example. The show looked like crap, but it strayed so far from God's light that hell felt cold, but people, if you want to define them as people, generally enjoyed it because of how bad it actually was. Mega's Bride is actually kind of similar to this. While the storyline isn't particularly strong, what keeps you hooked is the characters and the world they discover around them. The interactions between the characters feel genuine and lighthearted, so it's a show that keeps you coming back week to week because it's relaxing. It's an escape from our world to a reality that is imbued with magic, and while not a strong contender in the story department, leaving some to be desired, it definitely has you coming back week to week for more. The art direction and visuals are just that good. I think the show that has mastered low frame animation and high frame animation by far is Violet Evergarden. Mage's Bride has beautiful scenes, even ones with minimal animation, but Violet Evergarden is a crescendo of perfectly executed storyboarding and creative planning. Violet Evergarden has scenes with extreme motion and detail that are completely flawless. It draws you into the world, and those small details are what catch your eye. They make it feel real. When a scene has motion, it helps the scene feel more relatable. So when scenes are important, they always have more motion. But Violet Evergarden breaks this formula. While important scenes have incredibly high level of detail, smaller, more minimalistic scenes, scenes that interact directly with the environment, share similar levels. All of their low-budget shots are created during conversations and use different camera tricks to make the animation not feel janky or awkward. From going in and out of focus on objects in the room, or focusing on objects entirely while the character remains blurred out, or simply animating their mouth in a way that's elegant but not experience-breaking, makes me want to award Violet Evergarden as masters of animated story graph. They actually use common techniques that were designed by Disney to give two-dimensional characters depth in a 3D world. They allow their characters to feel more real by having them interact on a three-dimensional plane even though the characters themselves are two-dimensional, which is another term that is used in the animation industry, which is 2.5D. It simply refers to 2D characters interacting in the world as if it was three-dimensional. A crossroads of sorts between a 2D flat image and a tangible space that can be interacted in. Just look at the beauty in these scenes, the contrasts of light and dark, as well as the physical presence of the visual effects. They floor you. The depth of the show's characters and the feels they can deliver make this a strong contender for me in comparison to Magus. They are both beautiful shows, but I feel like Violet Evergarden just delivers more on both fronts. The animation and the story. Unlike Magus, whose visuals are what stick with you versus the story, Violet Evergarden's characters make you feel their love, their passion, their conflicts, and their pain, in synergy with their world. It all fits together like a handcrafted porcelain doll or an auto-memoir doll, if you will. In the show, Violet Evergarden is an auto-memoir doll, a pretty girl who writes letters for people who don't have the right words to deliver their message, or they're plain illiterate. But the other is a much nicer scenario. She takes this job to understand the meaning of love because she is exactly what her title is, a doll, an empty husk of a human being. She is completely devoid of any emotion, she cannot emphasize with anybody, her visual designs, her mannerism, and how she acts really help embellish the fact. The character is supported by the visuals, by her design, but also in her world. It's a harmonious symphony of animated goodness and a definite must-watch of a series.
Now something that isn't exactly fairly new in animation, but definitely always stands out like the red-headed stepchild of the family when it's done poorly is CGI. Take all of Berserk from 2016. There's not one scene that is redeemable in the show. Yeah, there's some really shit CGI in anime. Let's take the first season of Ruby, for example. Half the characters aren't even animated when you watch the show in the first season. The background characters are almost like ghosts from Halloween Town, and they pull you out of the experience as they stalk menacingly behind the characters. Oh, hold on, hold on, guys, real quick. I have to, I have to get the door. Hello? Open up. This is the Reddit R anime moderation team. Can I help you? Your video post is under arrest because Ruby is not an anime. Are you f kidding me? Okay, in the show Ruby, season one, the animation is incredibly lackluster. On the CGI front, besides all the action scenes done by Monty Ohm, it is incredibly forgetful, awkward, and downright cringeworthy sometimes. It definitely pulls you out of the show's experience. Good news I heard, they redid the first season, but I haven't gone back to watch it yet in their new engine or whatever they did, so I guess I'll leave it alone for now. The later seasons seem to be much better on the CGI front, and oh yeah, if this goes on our anime for some reason, I totally misspoke and meant our hentai mods, because Ruby clearly isn't hentai. It's not hentai because it's technically our Ruby not safe for work anyway. Wink. Anime CGI is one of those parts of animation that is really hit or miss. I barely need to even describe it. Just look at this, this, and it's all unnatural looking and is a way to make a scene cheaper and not as visually enhanced. Most of the time it is an immersion ruining instead of an immersion supporting experience. That is because you are trying to take something 3D and force it into a 2D or 2.5D space. It feels wrong and it's unnatural, just like the entire plot of Ero Manga Sensei. Two shows that absolutely nail CGI, though, are the recent releases of Princess Principal and Hosoke no Kuni, or Bland the Lustrous. First, let's start with Princess Principal. Watch this show. While it may have popularity in some areas of the internet, overall I feel it's a kind of hidden gem and not particularly that popular. The show's witty, fun, and has a really good twist that I didn't see coming. There was some foreshadowing to it throughout the series, but I was way too spellbound with everything else going on to really pay attention to it. It's about girls that attend an academy and are, well, spies. They go on missions and do cool spy shit with steampunk aesthetics. You have a wide range of characters with varying personalities, fitting all of your various harem cliches, except there's no guy, just girls, and no harem. Anyway, it's awesome, they have this floaty orb thing, and whoosh, off topic. Go watch this show and realize they have a great way of melding 2D and 3D that feels like it supports the scenes. Their story advancements and their characters versus just sticking out like ugly objects. The car scenes come to mind and are particularly cool and are both captivating and thrilling. 3D like this helps immerse you in the world and not ask what is it doing there. Then you have Hosoke no Kuni. The show Berserk wanted to be but never was and never will be. Hosoke no Kuni is essentially the hidden gem of anime CGI, no pun intended. Then you have Berserk. Berserk looks like it lost a fight with Dragon Ball Super over which one gets the lower budget per episode. Super clearly won this battle because we got Tapo's tantalizing abdominals and a ton of Rizzo- <laughs> Oh, ho, ho, ho. as they stole every last penny. Hosoke no Kuni has camera angles and dynamics that would make Quentin Tarantino jealous enough to steal them for his next blockbuster. Then later on down the line, Michael Bay will pretend he invented them. The colors, the lighting, the contrast is just perfect. The show came out of nowhere and really gave me hope for CGI anime. Hosoke no Kuni is the definition of hard work and craftsmanship in the world of animation. Colors pop, Scenes are beautiful, and the creativity has focus. The show feels like it was designed with a purpose, and it imprints it into your brain. It leaves a long-lasting impression of, wow, CGI doesn't have to suck. If you are looking for a new series, definitely pick it up. It will surprise you, shock you, and shake you to your core. Anime is created with the purpose to entertain people. The reason it's entertaining is the immersion. If you don't have immersion, you don't have a proper story, characters, or even a setting. We watch it because it captivates us, intrigues us, and inspires us. We escape the real world and live in the fantasies of others. If the animation allows us to do that, to escape reality for a simple 20 minutes, it did its job, and it did its job well. This is the beauty of animation part one. This episode was sponsored by absolutely nobody because I am just some schmuck that likes watching anime with pretty girls in it. Don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe. And the last thing I want you to do is to leave a comment on the anime that you find is the most immersive or overall the most visually appealing. Until next time, thank you for watching.